introduce himself um, uh, later on. So before we get started, let's dive into a little bit of housekeeping. I know none of us are new to Zoom, but there are some tips and tricks to consider for this session. First, if you're comfortable doing so, please turn on your video. Uh, and please do know that you know, the session is being recorded. And one thing to note is that the session was designed as a very um, interactive session. It's more of a conversation. So it's a dialogue really. So please feel free to engage, feel free to use the chat box and the emojis as often as you like, and feel free to take a, the conversation to show social media. Uh, we'll be sharing the Twitter handles of our speakers in the chat, as well as hashtags and the website of the organizations that are presenting. So yeah, let's, let's stay engaged like that. And that being said, um, please stay muted unless you're, you know, you're, you're speaking or posing a question. And then uh, for the best experience, while our speakers are participating in a panel discussion, you might want to put your Zoom view into speaker mode. Um, you just toggle at the top right of the, the screen and click this I'll talk in between gallery and speaker mode. And then uh, one last thing to note, at the end, we'll be taking action together. Um, so you may want to get your social accounts, social media accounts ready. Okay, so now that housekeeping is sorted, I would like to keep this evening off by paying respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of the land where the Office of Results Canada is in Ottawa. Uh, we at Results acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. The Algonquin people have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory today. Um, our discussion tonight could not have been, you know, a timelier. As we speak, it has been over uh, a year since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. Yet this week, India recorded the world's highest one-day surge in cases, and infections hit a record peak for a fifth day on Monday. Uh, we've been hearing some really tragic stories from India. Hospitals have been forced to turn away patients with oxygen sort of stock signs. And I, I, in addition to oxygen going out, intensive care units are operating at full capacity and nearly all ventilators are in use. Um, you know, roughly 100 Indians are succumbing every hour at this, at this point. And th th these figures are probably an undercount. Um, and as the dead toss, tall mounts, uh, crematories are overwhelmed and bodies are burned in the open air. So this deepening crisis stands in contrast to the improving picture in the higher income countries, which have vaccinated a significantly large share of their population um, and are not living in fear like the people in India, Nepal, Brazil, and Pakistan today. So this example really makes the, the global inequities very clear. And the strategy unfolding in India is absolutely heartbreaking. It's also a clear reminder that we won't be ending the pandemic anytime soon unless the majority of the world is immune to COVID-19. And the safest way to achieve that is with a vaccine. So this evening, as we celebrate World Immunization Week, uh, we have the opportunity to reflect on what it takes to vaccinate the world. So to commence this evening's webinar, I'm pleased to introduce you Norm Pillion. And though I'm sure many of you know him, will be leading our discussion. Norm, over to you. Oh, Norm, you're just on mute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I'm really excited uh, this World Immunization Week to moderate this timely webinar on taking action to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Like many of us here, I had the privilege of growing up in a country that had access to vaccines. And this means really the term vaccine hesitancy is a strange one for me as my relationship with vaccines has always been positive. I have a scar on my shoulder from my childhood smallpox vaccine, something that uh, many younger Canadians have never had. And it's really an example and testament to the power of vaccines and a disease that has largely been eradicated. Um, over the last few days, I've been watching, like many of us, I've been watching with horror and sadness at the events unfolding in India. 
it's always the poor countries that end up being left behind in times of crisis. And what's really unacceptable to me is that Canada and other countries are still blocking or not supporting free and open access to vaccines. So I think now is the time to introduce these amazing speakers that we have with us tonight, this great opportunity. Here to speak to us about vaccine hesitancy is Dr. Rosamond Lewis. Dr. Lewis is a public health physician focused on immunization and emergency preparedness and response. Now with the World Health Organization in the Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Lewis has served Médecins Sans Frontières, Ottawa Public Health, the, Can the Government of Canada and other agencies. Rosamond completed her training at McGill University in Montreal and through her career from bedside to global level, Rosamond has emphasized the importance of clear and empathic communication in achieving public health goals. Here to speak to us about TRIPS waivers is Mark Brender. Mark is National Director of Partners in Health Canada, a nonprofit social justice organization striving to make healthcare a human right for all people. Mark opened the PIH Canada office in Toronto in 2011 and is passionate about raising awareness of uh, funds for this effort and empowering Canadians to join the movement for global health equity. He previously held leadership positions with national and international charitable organizations. To discuss vaccine uh, readiness is Rowena Pinto, Chief Program Officer for UNICEF Canada. Rowena is the Chief Program Officer for UNICEF Canada, leading the efforts to promote the rights and well being of children in Canada around the world. UNICEF has saved more lives than any, uh, more children's lives than any other humanitarian organization. As a member of UNICEF's executive team, Rowena ensures that UNICEF's mission activities, which are focused on reaching every child and ensuring their well being, no matter where they are in the world, are well established, leveraged where possible, and communicated widely. She works effectively in partnership with her colleagues and stakeholders to engage UNICEF supporters in order to increase UNICEF's impact both internationally and domestically. Originally from Montreal, Rowena holds a master's degree in public policy and public administration from Concordia University. She lives in Toronto with her husband, who works in IT, and her son and twin daughters. I'll now hand it over to uh, Rosamond, who will speak to us about vaccine hesitancy. Thank you very much, Norm. Thank you, Hannah. It's a real pleasure to be uh, with you. I've, uh, I'm familiar with the work of Results Canada, and I think you're a fantastic organization. So um, congratulations to you and uh, keep it up. Um, thank you for mentioning, uh, of course, the purpose of this is to celebrate um, World Immunization Week, uh, which is something which WHO does celebrate around the world with its regional offices in every member state every year. And the theme this year is vaccines bring us closer. And so with everything that you've just introduced, um, not least what's happening in India, we can think about how vaccines bring us closer. Well, here I am talking to you. It's actually night over here and I'm not really standing in front of the WHO building, um, but I thought you might rather see that than my living room. And um, apologize if the lighting's not so great. <clears throat> but um, so we're able to talk to each other. Uh, it's not because of vaccines, but it's because we're talking about vaccines. So it's already one degree of separation, but it's, uh, it's allowing us to discuss these things. And uh, of course, physically vaccines bring us closer because it means that we can, um, while we continue with our public health measures uh, that we know are still necessary, we can of course uh, be more comfortable in, in our environments as we go about our day, knowing that we are fully protected. Um, unfortunately, as you've well pointed out, many people are not fully protected and it's going to be a while and too long before other parts of the world have access uh, to vaccines. And uh, I think uh, I'd like to join you in um, honoring the people of India at this time. It's really challenging for them and for other folks elsewhere. 
Um, I think vaccine hesitancy is perhaps not their greatest concern at the moment. Uh, they would love to be able to have access to the vaccines that uh, we've started to receive. So what is vaccine hesitancy? And um, is that the only term for it? So first of all, vaccine hesitancy does refer to a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of vaccine services. So we're not talking about lack of access, we're talking about um, delay in acceptance or refusal. It is a complex and context specific. It varies across time, it's multi-layered and it can refer to a single individual or it can refer to a community. That community can be um, a physical community, a village, a town. It can be a religious community, uh, a social community, spiritual community or it can be a virtual community or a political community, um, you can define community any which way you like. So vaccine hesitancy may not be limited to the individual. It may be related to um, what's going on in someone's community or someone's broader environment. Um, but we, we have alternate terms to that. So sometimes we try to pitch this uh, conversation in a more positive light. We talk about vaccine acceptance and vaccine confidence and vaccine demand. And we want to make those things grow. We want to grow vaccine acceptance or confidence or demand. Um, and so in order to do those things, we really need to do kind of a root cause analysis of what's, what's causing someone to be hesitant or acceptant, um, to have confidence in uh, the vaccine or the service, or to even ask for it, to demand it. And so there are many factors that can influence this. And we've mentioned community and environment. Um, there's also things like complacency, simple things like convenience. I mean, have any of us been late taking one of our children to a vaccination uh, appointment um, simply because it wasn't convenient uh, to get there at that time? Or those are things we kind of take for granted. Um, there's complacency. We really don't think uh, that uh, this is going to concern us at all. And so we don't see the diseases in the communities where we live. And so we become complacent about the diseases themselves. We may not actually be refusing the vaccine. We just don't really think about um, we're going to be affected or, or our families are going to be affected by, by the disease that the vaccine is supposed to protect against. So that is as true of uh, childhood vaccines and childhood diseases as it is today of COVID. As we know, we have many COVID deniers um, in our communities, uh, which presents a challenge to all of us. So there is a continuum of uh, folks who maybe accept all vaccines at one end, and at the other end, they might refuse all vaccines. And somewhere in the middle, there's a complex mix of possibly accepting, but I'm not sure. So yes, I'll take the vaccine, but I'm really uncertain. Um, maybe so accepting some vaccines, delaying some because of certain beliefs or refusing some. Um, and then refusing, but just also because you're not sure. So there's a huge continuum between, and that's why the word hesitancy seems to have uh, some purchase because it, it, it describes well that continuum. We're not actually just refusing all vaccines, um, but there may be some elements behind that. And uh, so some of those elements um, may be related to, you know, the vaccine itself, the different types of vaccines. So, so why are some people hesitant? Well, we have, um, as we've mentioned, the beliefs in the environment, but it may not be just the vaccine itself. And we'll come back to the vaccine in a moment. Um, it might be um, a sense that we really don't even need it. Like, sure, I believe in vaccines. So I was just thinking of an example before we came on online and I was thinking, well, okay, how about zombies? Someone's, I believe in zombies, but I don't think a zombie is gonna come after me, right? So the zombies are there. Zombie protection is a good thing. We should all be protected from zombies. Everybody should be protected from zombies, but I don't need zombie protection because I don't think the zombies are coming after me. So I might be fully in favor of zombie protection and still not believe that I need it. And so why do I not need it? Well, because I just don't perceive the risk. I don't think I'm at risk of a zombie attack or I don't believe that zombies exist at all. Yeah, zombie protection is a good thing, but you know what, they don't even exist. And this exactly happened to me in the, um, since we're having a conversation, as you said, <laughs> happened to me in the gas station the other day. I had just been uh, coming from uh, uh, my first vaccine appointment and I mentioned it to the um, lady behind her mask and behind the glass. And she said, oh, I won't be getting a vaccine. And I was like, oh, really, why? So we started chatting a little bit and then, and then she was like, well, when I saw that I was just starting to get through, then suddenly she said, 
oh, but it doesn't exist anyway. The disease doesn't exist. I'm like, oh, okay. Now we're on a, in a different conversation. And I was like, really? You don't think the disease is, exists at all? And, you know, well, why is that? And, uh, you know, what about the folks who are feeling very ill? And then her third remark was, well, in any case, if I get sick, it's good because I need a week off. So she was minimizing the idea that if she got sick or just had a positive test, that would be great because she'd get a week off work. So in, in the space of about a minute and a half, we went from having a conversation to vaccines to a conversation about just being fatigued and needing a week off work, and it, for which I was very empathetic, of course. So, so you can see how complex it can be and you can very quickly um, get to, well, I'm not saying I'm not pretending I got to the root of that particular conversation, but this whole area of vaccine hesitancy is really a huge area of scientific endeavor right now. So the World Health Organization has a strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, um, which oversees all uh, experts from around the world, advising WHO and advising our director general. And within that, there are different working groups. And so the SAGE working group on vaccine hesitancy is one of them. And one of the many of the things they try to do is come up with tools and methods, um, how to do surveys, how to do questionnaires, how to assess the situation in the community, how to do root cause analysis, um, communication tips, and so on. So there are a number of of uh, tools that are that are available, many tools available for those who are interested in pursuing it further. And then the last thing um, to mention is, as we said, the, the, the vaccine itself. Does it cause, uh, if, if, if someone is concerned about adverse events, what is actually an adverse event? It could be something that happens after someone's received a vaccine. It could be they get knocked on the head with a tennis racket. That doesn't, it's not because they got the vaccine. So that's an adverse event following immunization, but there's no causal relationship necessarily, but you have to investigate to figure out if there is a causal relationship or not. You can have a vaccine related incident, but it might be program related. So there's a program error. The person giving the vaccine has made a mistake. There's been a, a mistake in the reconstitution of the vaccine. If it's a dried vaccine that has to be reconstituted with a diluent. So it's vaccine related, but it's not caused by the vaccine itself. And finally, you might have vaccine associated um, adverse events or side effects. So we tend to refer to the milder ones as side effects, which is the sore arm, the fever, the shakiness. Uh, whatever mild side effects we have, um, or we might have serious adverse events, which could lead to disability or even death, which, as we know, are extremely rare, um, but do happen with some vaccines in certain groups, and hence we need to investigate uh, who, who's at risk. Um, so those are the things I wanted to mention. Um, I think I've gone over time. Um, so we could talk a little bit about navigating misinformation, disinformation, and so on. Um, but the main thing that, um, that we could think about is how do we ourselves navigate uh, the, the information world? Um, and a few very quick tips uh, would be just to make sure that um, you're assessing the source of information that you're seeing. You're seeing a tweet, you're seeing something on social media. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from Results Canada or is it coming from a disreputable website or source? Secondly, go beyond the headlines. Don't just read the headline. And in fact, now some social media sites you'll see, you try to retweet an article and Twitter comes up and says, would you like to read the article before you retweet it? You know, oh yeah, okay, I guess I better read this article before I retweet it. So sometimes you can develop partnerships, WHO has done that, develop partnerships with these big social media entities to, uh, to engage them in, in helping manage the infodemic. Uh, thirdly, identify the author of the tweet, if the, if the person is reputable or not. Um, fourthly, check the date. Sometimes people will use old pictures, old graphs, old figures, and try and pretend that they apply to a situation that's there today. Um, examine any supporting evidence that you might come across, uh, and so on. So these are all little tips that we can all use um, before we quickly share on a WhatsApp or on a tweet the information that we've received uh, related to vaccines or anything else. So. I think I better give the floor to the next person and be happy to engage in discussion with you. Thanks so much, Rosamond. Uh, we'll hand it over to uh, Mark now uh, to talk to us about uh, intellectual property around vaccines. Um, thanks so much, Norm. Um, and thank you, Hannah. And thanks, Dr. Lewis, for your presentation. And a special thank you, of course, to Results for organizing this forum and bringing us together and to everyone for taking the time to be with us. Um, so it's important for me to share right off the top that I'm not a health professional, uh, nor a trade or intellectual property expert. So to the extent that thoughts here hopefully are relevant, it's only because of 
partners in health's experience working to add to advance health equity for impoverished communities by learning from those communities and by listening to and leveraging their expertise. And our PH colleagues around the world are united in their support of the TRIPS waiver, uh, because first, this is an, is an issue of equity. And second, because the forces fighting against the waiver amount to really more structural violence against the communities and populations that we serve in that they are actively working to deprive certain people of a right to health. And I believe the stakes in the TRIPS waiver debate have to be stated that bluntly, that that's really what this is about. What do I mean by this? So the TRIPS waiver, as people know, is a petition at the World Trade Organization initially led by South Africa and India, and now co-sponsored or supported by more than 100 countries that would give countries the ability to waive IP restrictions that currently preclude companies within their borders from manufacturing patent protected COVID-19 diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and even PPE. It's necessary in part because the biggest impediment to increased speed of vaccinations globally is artificially restricted global vaccine supply currently dictated entirely by private pharmaceutical companies. So the waiver is currently opposed by the US and by European countries. And Canada is one of a handful of countries officially undecided on an issue that has now been on the table for seven months. And so there's a map, if we, if Hannah, if we could pull the map up um, now, that would be great. This map that you'll see comes from MSF and the MSF Access to Medicines campaign deserves a ton of credit for the work they have done. Um, countries, if we can see it, yeah, thank you so much. Countries in um, yellow and green support the waiver. Countries in orange oppose it. And we see Canada as one of a few countries officially undecided. And if you think looking at the map, there is neo-colonialism at work here, I would agree. And it's really hard to draw any other conclusion when you look at, at the contours of that map. And let's remember that movements to decolonize global health are now calling for us to yield space and power to voices from the places where uh, many NGOs, many of those engaged in humanitarian and development work um, where we work and to recognize that the disparities that we are working to address are structural disparities with historical causes, among them colonialism, racism, resource extraction, unfair trade policies and the like. And so to reiterate Canada, uh, by not supporting the voices in favor of the TRIPS waiver from all the countries where our international aid dollars are spent, far from being neutral, I would argue is an act of structural violence that is actually deepening the historical disparities that we are fighting to overcome in non-COVID times and indeed during COVID for that matter. And this is because the best case scenarios with current global manufacturing framework, most countries in the world won't have sufficient vaccination coverage to get anywhere close to herd immunity until 2023 or 2024. So it's important to note that no country opposing the TRIPS waiver has disputed this timeline, nor have they proposed anything other than the status quo to address it. So in not supporting the waiver, countries such as Canada are in effect agreeing that that timeline is okay, when I think most of us on this call would agree that outcome would be a colossal moral failure for starters. And the implications of that status quo are first, that many, many more people will die, it took nine months for the first million global deaths due to COVID, four months for the second million, and three months for the third million. And we are now in the third wave, as we all know, and with variants and what is happening in India, the fourth million will be even quicker. Second, the economic devastation and collapse of health systems today in India, tomorrow we don't yet know where, will bring further loss of life where people don't die of COVID, but die due to COVID and its countless secondary effects. And third, if we truly believe that, as we often say, that we're not safe until everyone is safe, and we're not doing anything to change that status quo, it's a colossal Canadian public policy failure by our government and all governments that are failing to support this. And so the question has to be asked all for what? Um, in our case, it seems like there can only be two reasons for the opposition. One, 
fear of upsetting the pharma industry, the international trade regime, and related business interests, even though we are not currently manufacturing COVID vaccines in Canada. Uh, or two, we don't want to be offside with our traditional allies, the US, the EU, Britain. And of course, there are a number of common arguments uh, that countries opposing the TRIPS waiver have made and continue to make. The main ones relate to questioning why existing flexibilities within TRIPS aren't good enough. For example, compulsory licensing provisions or whether capacity to ramp up production safely actually exists in low and middle income countries. It absolutely does. Or if technology transfer, not patents and IP are the real issue, when of course they are closely related and can be dealt with together and must be dealt with together. So I hope we can get more into some of these questions in Q&A, but safe to say for now that TRIPS waiver advocates have answered these questions in detail time and time again over the past six months, as is documented in publicly available WTO transcripts. But I want to close uh, with a quick story on the TRIPS waiver last week that appeared in the Hill Times, an Ottawa newspaper. The story quoted a Canadian US trade lawyer and quoting the story here, quote, Mr. War Mr. Warner, the trade lawyer, uh, said at this stage of the pandemic, this is a story from, from uh, last week again, he didn't think the waiver, the TRIPS waiver would have an impact. And a bit further on, the story says, Mr. Warner noted that when more vaccines are developed and the process becomes standardized, discussions on increased manufacturing will be, quote, much more relevant, end quote, adding that historically, licensing has been for a past version of a drug and not the latest model. And isn't that the problem that we're facing? Um, that we've seen this before, and we need to understand that we've seen this before. This idea of experts in Canada or the US or Europe saying what will have impact and when it will have impact for people in Africa or Asia or Latin America, who, if we took the time to ask them, would be saying very different things about who is deserving today and who can afford to wait. We once heard that delivering antiretrovirals for HIV in Africa wouldn't have much impact. Uh, and we heard that treating drug-resistant TB wouldn't have much impact, or treating cancer in impoverished countries wouldn't have an impact. And we hear this every time and any time the rich world and poor world are conditioned to expect different standards of care in times of crisis or not. And we need to push back against it as hard as we possibly can. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, Mark. That was really informative and, and very sobering as well. I know that uh, PIH have be, has been fighting the same battles for a really long time. Uh, next, we'll hand it over to uh, Rowena, who's going to talk to us about vaccine readiness. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Hannah, would you be able to pull up my slides, please? And you're going to be controlling them, correct? OK, great. Okay, well, I'll get started. So thank you to Results Canada for inviting me to speak on the importance of immunization during what is an unprecedented time within our own borders and beyond, and to provide more insight into what it will take to vaccinate the world and end the pandemic. Today, I will be speaking to the importance of vaccine readiness. What is vaccine readiness and why it is important in helping to end the COVID-19 pandemic for everyone? To start, let me tell you about the key players on the world stage and the role that UNICEF is playing in the historic rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Sorry. Um, so in April 2020, the World Health Organization launched a new global collaboration called the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, or ACT Accelerator for short to support the development, production, and distribution of COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines. The ACT Accelerator is the world's best chance at providing safe, effective COVID-19 vaccines that are available and affordable to all. It has four pillars, diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, also known as the COVAX facility, and a fourth pillar called Health Systems Connector that works across the other three. UNICEF has been driving the global childhood immunization agenda for three decades, reaching almost half of the world's children each year. 
In the last 20 years, UNICEF has helped reach more than 760 million children with life-saving vaccines, preventing more than 13 million deaths. It has delivered vaccines in some of the most remote and hardest to reach countries under the most difficult conditions. And this is why UNICEF had been asked as, and has stepped forward to fill a role that no other organization is equipped to do. And that is to support the delivery of vaccinations in low to middle income countries, which have joined COVAX. As the world's leading procurer and provider of essential vaccines for children, UNICEF is working together with partners across the ACT Accelerator to ensure that all countries participating have safe, equi equitable, and fast access to 2 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine by the end of 2021. This is enough to vaccinate 20% of the 92 low to middle income countries participating in COVAX while prioritizing essential workers and high-risk groups. Ensuring everyone has access to vaccines and particularly the most vulnerable is critical to protecting the development gains Canada and others have made over the last few decades. Low to middle income countries cannot be left behind as high income countries vaccinate their populations. And as we know, the pandemic will end for no one until it ends for everyone. Next slide. So supporting countries to ready their immunization programs for this historic rollout is one of the most important areas of work that needs to be done to ensure effective, equitable access to vaccines. As we know, transporting the vaccines to these countries is only one part of the solution. We need to ensure that these vaccines end up in people's arms. Low and middle income countries who have signed on to access the COVID-19 vaccine through COVAX are only eligible to receive the vaccine when key readiness criteria is met. UNICEF is working to support countries to ready their immunization programs for this historic rollout by helping countries fine tune their readiness plans, identify any gaps and ensure the plan is as good as it can be. So what does vaccine readiness really entail? Vaccine readiness includes helping countries strengthen their cold and supply chains so that they have adequate infrastructure to safely store, transport, and distribute vaccines from the minute they arrive in country to when they are administered into people's arms. It includes training frontline health workers in safe storage, transport, handling, and administration of COVID-19 vaccines. And vaccine readiness also includes providing technical assistance to national and regional health authorities to support planning and execution of national vaccine deployment plans to ensure that no one is left behind. And last, but certainly not least, in what we heard Dr. Lewis speak so eloquently about, a critical area that we need to focus on is to ensure that vaccines turn into vaccinations. And that means that we really must tackle vaccine hesitancy ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to accurate and timely information on vaccines, directly ad addressing vaccine misinformation and working at the community level to build trust in vaccines. Messaging on vaccine hesitancy needs to be tailored in many cases, as we heard. So an overarching message might not necessarily work. And we also have to work with communities on the delivery of these messages as that too, how in terms of how they are delivered might need to vary between the context and the community. Since the start of the COVAX facility vaccine rollout, COVAX has shipped more than 38 million COVID-19 vaccine doses to over 100 economies. On the 24th of February, 2021, Ghana became the first country in the world to receive the COVID-19 vaccine through the COVAX facility with support from WHO, Gavi, CEPI, and UNICEF and partners. And UNICEF provided technical assistance, procured and shipped the vaccines, syringes, and cold chain equipment, and supported the government with social mobilization efforts. WHO and UNICEF provided support to the government in planning the vaccination campaigns and training healthcare workers. This was a historic step towards our goal to ensure equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. With that being said, despite this progress, the ACT Accelerator remains severely underfunded. Canada has the opportunity to build on its contributions towards COVAX and the ACT Accelerator with support for vaccine readiness and delivery. 
the G7 Leaders Summit is a great opportunity to do so. If you're interested in finding more about um, UNICEF's role or any of the latest COVAX developments, situation reports on the needs of children in country or region, you can visit the unicef.ca website or unicef.org. And just know that each step we are taking forward in the fight against COVID-19 will bring us further along the path to recovery for the billions of children and families affected around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rowena. That was, uh, that was uh, amazing. And it's a real testament to the effort uh, that's being put in to getting the uh, COVAX vaccines out there. And uh, thanks, of course, to all three speakers uh, for the amazing work they've been doing. Uh, uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, now we get to the best part. We, we get to have a discussion with the, the three speakers. And, uh, and this is a portion where we get to ask questions. And uh, the one way to do that is to uh, raise your hand or, uh, if you're having trouble finding that icon, you can also unmute yourself and uh, you can also submit questions to the chat. And uh, between uh, Hannah and I, we will do our best to make sure that as many people are heard while we're scanning uh, the different faces. So I open it up to everyone here. To Uh, hi, uh, Ainsley Morris uh, has her hand up for a question. Hi, hi. Ainsley. Hi, thanks for uh, thanks for having this. It's been super interesting, and there was something on CDC front burner about this as well. Uh, morning, or yesterday's and I guess this is for Mark more than anything. So we've had that success with antiretrovirals, right? But that was huge, and it changed so many lives. How do we replicate that for the vaccine, like for, for the COVID-19 vaccines? Like, and we, I mean, we also did it with, you know, legal, polio, not, not as, as concerned as an effort, but how can we replicate that success? I mean, I know it's ages, but you think that because we learned from that, we can accelerate this to have that same success with COVID-19 um, vaccine. So just wondering what, um, what else we can do, like how do we, how do we replicate that to get this vaccine good? Yeah, thanks, Ainsley. Um, and yeah, obviously, antiretrovirals were a huge, um, the, the largest step in the fight against HIV. It is worth noting, of course, though, that there was a years and years between when they became available to the West and when when um, the world saw fit to make antiretrovirals, not just saw fit to make them available, but saw fit that the effort was actually worth it, that the powers in that, that be, um, you know, there were people arguing that it isn't worth it to actually treat HIV in Africa. And all we needed to do was focus on prevention. Um, there was a lot of talk at the time that there wasn't the cold chain, people couldn't tell time. This is a real quote that was said that um, there weren't enough doctors and nurses and supply chain. And so what it took um, in part, certainly activism, activists in the global south were critical to um to getting it to happen and developing access and activists in the global north who had access um the gay community um in the u.s uh certainly that was very loud and very outspoken about the injustice and i think you know really talking about that solidarity that's needed that we really need uh right now today again because if we have that sort of time gap with COVID, um, where it will be five, six, seven years before we get equitable distribution, um, I don't think any of us want to consider the consequences. So I think it's things like this, that we all need to be extremely vocal, that we don't allow 
uh, international trade regimes and, and patent regimes to get in the way of what we think is a human right. Um, and I think also in part it's, yes, there's a lot of self-interest that we all have in ensuring that, you know, we aren't going to be safe until the world is safe and using that as the motivation. But uh, there was a really interesting article in the Atlantic yesterday that talked about, and, and Tony Fauci was quoted that talked about the search for a universal coronavirus vaccine that is kind of, that they're working on, that scientists would try to identify different parts of a, of a spike protein that they could, um, that they could use to develop something that would be effective against all coronavirus. And if that happens, say, and if we don't have a self-interest case by saying, then we would be protected, the West would be protected, um, what's left, what then? And so where is our global solidarity that will say that it is unjust that we leave it to the market to determine who has access to that? So I think these kinds of forums, groups like, like results and people really making the case that we need to say as a global community that this is about human rights, this is about solidarity and to make those arguments as forcefully as we possibly can. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think we, uh, would any of the other panelists uh, like to speak on this at all or anyone else has thoughts before we move on to uh, the next question? Okay. Well, I, could just, oh. I could just add quickly that um, that I, I totally agree with everything that uh, you've said, Mark, in your very impressive presentation. Um, the, gl the glass is, of course, half full, half empty, depending on how you look at it. And, and the, the, of course, not only the development of these vaccines, but the rollout has been remarkable. And when you compare to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, it was a much milder one. So we don't remember it so well or noticed it so much, um, but there was a seven or eight month lag by the time other countries got any vaccines at all, uh, the pandemic was actually over. So, the world, UNICEF, WHO, and all its partners, governments, member states, learned from that and tried to put together this act accelerator that Rowena has so clearly described. What we need to do now is, is yes, acknowledge that as success um, and build on it. Um, so I just wanted to uh, support that point and emphasize it. I think uh, Marley has a question. She has her hand up. Hi, um, can you guys hear me okay? I'll assume. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, these are awesome presentations. I have uh, two questions. The first one is for Dr. Lewis. Um, often when we, th when I think of vaccine hesitancy, I think about it uh, within like the ultimate beneficiary. So I think about it as the people lining up to get their vaccines, potentially being hesitant. But I wonder if you had any thoughts about vaccine hesitancy within national governments and how institutions um, like the WHO are kind of working to balance kind of concerns about the risks of certain vaccines with this notion of choice that we also have instilled in um, global health frameworks. To give a little bit more context, um, one of the countries I work with quite closely is, is Haiti. And there was a point, I think they've gone back and forth, but there was a point where the Ministry of Health there was saying that they didn't want AstraZeneca and that they wanted choice in the vaccines and they were, they were prioritizing choice for Pfizer, Moderna, et cetera. Um, so just wondering if you could comment on that. And then my second question for Mark is, um, Mark, this idea about compulsory licensing, why isn't that something that's an option for countries in, in, um, in an effort to produce, uh, to have a domestic capacity for vaccine production? Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marley. That's a really great question. I agree with you that as, as I mentioned earlier, that hesitancy, if we call it that, or acceptance or demand um, can be community-wide. And as you point out, it can be nationwide, um, or it can be the government on behalf of its citizens. I think the issue there is um, the false equivalence of saying we want this vaccine versus that vaccine, or this vaccine, sometimes in the case of individuals, especially versus nothing at all. And what is not 
perhaps uh, what we need to articulate more is what is the risk of the vaccine versus the risk of not having the vaccine at all? What is the risk of the disease? And right now in the middle of a pandemic, it's with vaccine shortage worldwide, um, the right risks to compare are the risks of the pandemic and the disease um, and the side effects and the deaths and so on. Um, while the viruses mutate and all of that, those are the accumulation of many risks at the individual and community and national level compared to, and we're not saying it's a hypothetical risk, but it's a low risk of a particular side effect, for example, that may be, you know, one in a million or four in a million or, or, or it, which remains to be really determined in terms of causality. So the community, the global community or, or your individual physician is not denying that there is a risk necessarily, it's which risks to compare to each other. And, and that's where we kind of fall down on the job or people just get confused because it's like, oh, I've heard all this on the radio and I really don't want that thing. Um, but it's, it's really bringing to the attention, well, what are the actual risks to compare? And it's, it's a hard thing to do. It's really hard, but it's important. And it's equally important at the level of someone, as you mentioned, a government who's now acting on behalf of, uh, of thousands or millions of people. So for that kind of thing, you know, the, the answer might, one part of the answer might be really engaging in policy dialogue. What is it that they're looking for? Um, what are the benefits that they're seeking? What are the, you know, the risks that they're trying to avoid? Um, what needs to go into the conversation to make, to have a discussion that leads to uh, a decision that everyone is comfortable with. And, and, and sometimes that's all you can do is really engage in policy dialogue at that level until, until people are on the same page and they understand the same terms and that kind of thing. It's a pathway, it's, not, it's, a, it's a journey, it's, it's not just the destination. Thank you very much. And just, um... Super quickly on the compulsory licensing, I think there's probably two main things. One is that um, many Western countries, rich countries have, while compulsory licensing is a provision that's available, they have actively worked to politically punish any countries that have tried to use it um, because they don't really want the end result. And so um, they've been discouraged from using it. And it's funny that lobbyists and um, you know, have continued to um, encourage countries not to do it at the same time while these same countries are holding up that provision as a reason why TRIPS waiver isn't necessary. And I think then the more technical reason is that, you know, even with the mRNA, mRNA vaccines, there are patents that are distributed among many countries, among many different access, uh, many different production points that belong to many different countries. And so what's really needed is a coordinated global response as opposed to each individual country on a case by case, micro by micro step to be navigating through these challenges that in many cases they aren't, uh, they aren't really equipped to handle. Okay, so I think we're gonna go uh, to a question from the chat box, which is from uh, Chitra. And the question is, is vaccine nationalism always wrong? Don't governments need to balance the needs of their own citizens and their responsibility to the world? And I'll open that up to all three speakers. Maybe I can jump into that one. Um, uh, thanks, Chitra. Uh, yes, um, that is what we're seeing, obviously, is that governments are elected to uh, primarily look after their own citizens. And that's why working um, on such a global level is so difficult. Um, that's one of the reasons that we have to balance that with something like um, the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX facility. And that was the whole purpose was that all countries would actually join in and be able to use a uh, group purchasing power to, to access vaccines and then equitably um, distribute it around the world. Um, the reality is, is that that's harder to do when we do have countries that are receiving a lot of pressure from their citizens. So, um, you know, COVAX is supposed to be that global 
facility that enables this to happen. Um, but as I mentioned, um, you know, we still have a lot of challenges in terms of being fully funded. And as I mentioned for 2021, to be fully funded would mean reaching 20% of the world's um, low to middle income uh, countries' populations, which as you know, is not herd immunity by any means. Um, so there's issues around supply and et cetera. I mean, we've seen India really step up. That's the saddest part about this is India really did set, set, uh, step up as a global supplier, um, but has had to pull back a bit because of what's happening in country. And of course, you know, I think family in India, that's particularly close to my heart. Um, but you, you see this balance that countries do have to have to play, um, which is why, you know, the global effort is so, so important and, and needs to be adequately funded. Over. And I'll, I'll just jump in quickly. Yeah, I, in, in many ways, I agree um, in that it would be you know, a, a really, really big ask to ask the Canadian government or the US government or any government to stop vaccinating their citizens after they've reached long-term care, in our case, long-term care homes and health workers and say, we are gonna pause. Um, I don't think any of us in Canada would advocate for that. Um, fortune, not, not fortunately, but you know, what we often forget is that the real issue is that there's an artificially created limited supply, right? Limited supply isn't a fact of the world. It's created by the trade regimes. We say that pharmaceutical companies are able to dictate how much they produce and where it goes. And that can be overcome if we have the will to do it. Um, so yes, I agree that, that you know countries have responsibility to their citizens and we all have a responsibility to ensure that everywhere where we can manufacture vaccines is able to do so, and that's not currently the case. Thanks, I think this is a really tough question and uh, an important one. As you say, there's maybe a couple of elements that we could consider, uh, a couple of layers of the onion we could, we could peel back. So for example, countries such as Canada and the US and a few others um, did jump in and undertake bilateral agreements with several manufacturers all at once. The idea being nobody knew which vaccines were gonna come out first, which were gonna be the best, et cetera, the best, it's all real. Um, and so countries had the wherewithal to engage, to invest in upfront contracts, did that. and. That means that effectively, um, those countries may have three times as many vaccines as they actually need. So they will never use all those vaccines. So even at that point, the question is, how soon can a government act to give that supply back to the global community? Either to not purchase it and release the contract or to uh, purchase the vaccines but donate them directly to COVAX. Um, some countries have donated to other countries, and that's where the vaccine diplomacy comes in as opposed to vaccine nationalism, uh, giving to your favorite country, such as when the US decided to give a million doses to Canada. And um, I'm sure we were all very happy as Canadians, uh, but at the same time, you're thinking, wow, isn't there another country that needs it more than Canada right now? <laughs> so it's, it's that access, you know, um, uh, Canada, US, uh, Mexico axis, that political axis um, was very important in the decision making at that time and is always very important in any national decision making. So that's why the role of, of organizations such as yours becomes so important because you look at things from a slightly different angle and you can advocate for using a different frame of reference to say, okay, well, finally the US released. 60 million doses of AstraZeneca that they finally concluded they weren't going to use, but they'd been sitting on it for weeks um, and, and probably just didn't quite know, you know, which way to take it, where, where it should go. In fact, it's not still not certain, but Canada can already now uh, release some of the contracts or some of the vaccine doses that may not be um, going to be used in the near future. So there's, 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 there's nuances, there's gradations. And even if, one country is fully catered for, that additional supply may now be freed up 
um, and can be uh, can be provided. So having politicians be really acutely aware of of what well, everyone knows about Covax and the Act Accelerator, but to be aware that how soon can they act? Who can they talk to? Let's move this. Let's move this stuff. Have a sense of urgency about it. And I think the advocacy um, that uh, that organizations and individuals can bring is to try and instill that sense of urgency to help make those decisions and move them faster. Thanks so much, uh, Rosamond. And thanks to the speakers. I'm going to hand things back to Hannah now, who's going to do the action and uh, wrap up. Thank you so much for speakers and for this engaging conversation. I think we all have a better understanding of how vaccines can bring us closer to ending the pandemic and the absolutely urgent need to support uh, vaccine equity and uptake. But the good thing is each and every single one of us can take meaningful action and we can start tonight to get the attention and, you know, and, and mobilize the response from decision makers and donors. We need to seek advocacy action so that we create an environment uh, within which political will exists. And our Results Canada, uh, we work to equip and mobilize people like you to take meaningful high impact action in support of a better world for all. And here's what we can do together tonight. So we have three actions, we're gonna do them together. I'm gonna share my screen with you. The first is we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna show you an open letter that medical students uh, have written to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau asking him, you know, urging Canada to support the TRIPS waiver. So I'm going to post the link in the chat. And then I'll go, I'm going to share my screen so that you see the letter. Okay, so this is the letter. You can read it, and then here you can, you know, enter the details and make sure to submit it. Even if you're not a medical student in Canada, you can um, still sign it. So this is one thing you can do tonight. Second, we can go to Results Canada's website. I will share the link with you. If you have not done so already, you can take action on our Stop the, Divide, the Deadly Divide campaign that spotlights the growing divide in access to vaccines. So get your um, social media accounts ready. I'm gonna post the link in the chat. You can go here, I'll, I'll share my screen again, and then we can tweet together. Okay, so when you click on the link that I shared, it brings you here. And you see here, you have different actions that you can take. In this case, we're gonna be using our voice on social media. So you can click here on this pre-written tweet. It's gonna open your Twitter account and the message is already posted. So all you have to do is click on tweet and post. And this is one way of making noise, of making sure that the message is getting across on social media and creating awareness. And then one last action that you can take because we're on Twitter already, is we can follow someone very influential, um, professor and Canada Research Chair of Epidemiology and Global Health at McGill University, Dr. Pai. So he has been working with his colleagues to take rapid action in response to the unfolding crisis by mobilizing action via a new initiative. So I'm gonna share his Twitter handle in the chat and we can go follow him together. There we go. I'm gonna share my screen. So, 
one to pi, and then follow. And then let's be sure to amplify all of the messages that's gonna be getting across about the action that we're mobilizing on the response to the India crisis. So those are three actions that we can take tonight. Please make sure to disseminate this as widely as you can. Um, before we wrap up, thank you so much for participating, for taking action with us. And as it became clear from our speakers to end this pandemic, we need to take a diversity of different actions and it doesn't end tonight. Uh, we're currently coordinating with the wider global health sector in Canada, and we'll be coming to you soon with additional actions that you can take to support our calls on Canada to end COVID everywhere. Um, before we sign off for the night, maybe we can take a picture so that we can uh, share on social media. So if you're comfortable turning on your videos for the, for the picture, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. I'm gonna count down. Three, two, one. And it's done. Good night. And as we end the discussion here, let's continue with the conversation online. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Good night.